Diving right into a game here at Oracle Park as the Miami Marlins are taking on the San Francisco Giants as the Fish are sending out Sandy Alcantara. That's how it's pronounced. Even I know that. I don't get paid seven figures to know things like that. Tyler Skaggs on the hill for the Giants, making his 19th start of the season. Take a look at the Giants lineup 1-2-9, as well as the Marlins opposing lineup. Start things off top of the first inning. Rosel Herrera at the plate. What was that? He swung at it, chopped at it, after it was already in the catcher's glove, and then he proceeds up with another dumb chop. It's not a sword, Roselle. What are you doing? Move things on to the bottom of the first, where the king of the first inning home run, Jock Peterson, comes to the plate. He had 21 home runs before this AB. Now he's got 22. Gives the Giants an early 1-0 lead with a long solo shot. Way out of here in right field as it's a 1-0 game, but then Gabby Guerrero came to the plate in the top of the second, and he's also going to send one out a long way, this one into left field, hitting those bleachers, and it ties the game up at 1, not the start that Skaggs wanted, as then the immediate next batter comes up in Jorge Alfaro, and he's going to power one out into left center field, that's going to get down into the gap, and the fleet-footed catcher has no problem getting himself a double, so the next batter up is Garrett Cooper, the first baseman, former Yankees legend, as this one's going to be sent out to a long center field, but it's going to be caught in the fly. They do not tag up Alfaro. And then Victor Victor Mesa pops one up the second base, as then Skaggs gets out of the jam. Top of the fourth now, Ronald Butler at the plate, pops one up into foul territory. Fuentes ranges over to the fence, reaches over, makes the snag, and robs Butler of a proper A-B. So top of the fifth now, where Garrett Cooper is going to hit one into left center more this time. That one's going to get down into the gap rather than being robbed by Margot. So a leadoff double for Cooper, and Skaggs is immediately in some trouble, but then he proceeds to get Victor Victor Mesa to pop up to the catcher Bart for out number one. Next batter up is the pitcher Sandy Alcantara, who of course doesn't do anything, pops up the shallow left field. They obviously do not tag up Cooper, and then GM Brony, the second baseman, goes down looking on a up-and-in fastball as Skaggs gets out of the jam. Bottom of the fifth inning, and the Giants are now on top again. Another solo shot in this ballgame as Joey Bart sends one out to left field, left center I should say, as that's way out of here. A 2-1 lead now for the Giants. Bottom of the sixth as Jock Peterson gets one on the ground that finds the hole on the right side through the shift. So a base knock for him, followed up by a base knock for Javi Baez to the left side of the infield. So back-to-back -back singles, first and second with two outs now for Gilberto Fuentes, who's going to send one opposite way out to left field, and that's going to just barely carry over the fence. A three-run shot for Gilberto Fuentes, as it's now a 5-1 to one lead on his 14th home run of the season. We move things on to the top of the seventh, where Austin Davis comes on. First out of the inning would be on a ground ball. Diving play by Shelvin Noisy on the outfield grass gets the fleet-footed Alfaro at first. And that would be the first out of a 1-2-3 inning for Austin Davis as we take another look at this diving stop from Sheldon Noisy, showing off the leather. Brandon Finnegan came on, recently called up from AAA Sacramento. After he allowed a leadoff double, he would proceed to strike out GM Brony. And then the next batter, Roselle Herrera, would also chop one over to second base. Noisy charges, makes the play over at first base. So runner on third with two outs for Brian Anderson now. And he goes down swinging on the up and in fastball. Still a 5-1 game. We move things on to the bottom of the eighth where the former giant Tyler Lyons, the lefty, comes on. With two outs and runner on first, Gilberto Fuentes is committing some lefty-on-lefty -lefty crime. That's going to get down in the gap, up against the brick wall in right center. And Fuentes, the fleet-footed first baseman, is able to get into third base with a triple. Drives in the run, makes it 6-1. to one. Finnegan stayed on for the ninth in a non-save situation. Ends the game as the Giants win this one over the lowly Marlins, 6-1. to one. Easy win for the Giants. Gilberto Fuentes gets player of the game honors as he had a three-run shot and then also an RBI triple, and those were his two hits on the day, while Jock Peterson and Joey Bart both had solo shots on the day in this 6-1 victory for the San Francisco Giants.
And now we move on to the trade deadline portion of the episode. We have arrived at the end of July. Our Giants are, of course, in contention for another playoff spot, and we are looking to go deep in the playoffs and hopefully finish off what we could not do last season. And I felt like in order to do that, we needed to make a big acquisition to help our bullpen, which is really the only glaring weakness on this team this season. And we went out and we acquired a big one. Jordan Hicks of the St. Louis Cardinals, has been acquired by the Giants in return for Joe Gray Jr., Sheldon Trevino, and Tetsudo Yamada. Obviously, we're in a super tight race in the NL West with the Padres currently one game behind them. And then the Cardinals are dead last in the NL Central, and pretty much anyone who is good on their team is already gone. Jose Martinez is in Washington, Carlos Martinez is in Houston, and then at the end of the season, they are set to lose Jack Flaherty. They're set to lose Jairo Munoz, who's been one of their best players by far. And then, of course, Jordan Hicks, who is on the last year of his his deal. So we went out and acquired Jordan Hicks. We all know who he is. The guy throws 100 plus miles an hour. He absolutely shoves. He struggled a fair bit in the early seasons of this franchise, but since 2021, he has been a shutdown reliever for the Cardinals, and he is having a career year this season with a 1-2-9 ERA, a 2-1-4 FIP through 34, 35 innings pitched. And that's as a closer on a last place team. The thing about Hicks is that he is most likely just a rental for us, sort of like how Aurelis Chapman was a rental for the Cubs, but he did help them win a World Series. So the determining factor in this trade will be, do we win the World Series or do we not? Now, I wouldn't necessarily be opposed to bringing back Hicks once we do hit the offseason because we are going to be getting a lot of money off the books, but it depends on how much he's going to want. If he's going to want more than $10 million, which he's probably going to, I'm not going to bring him back, most likely. Now, as far as who the Cardinals are getting in return, we already know about Joe Gray Jr., 23 years old, 75 overall B potential outfielder. They can play him anywhere in the outfield. He'll most likely end up in right field because obviously they do have Harrison Bader, who is a defensive wizard in center field, and he should be a great player for them for many years to come. Now, Sheldon Trevino is a 22-year-old, 76 overall B potential right-handed pitcher. They've already lost Carlos Martinez. They are set to lose Jack Flaherty, and I'm like 99% sure they're set to lose Michael Waka as well, so they're going to take a big chunk of a loss to their rotation so they need some young starters, and Shelton Trevino is definitely one of those. Tetsuda Yamada, obviously we know what his deal is. On paper, he's a solid Major League infielder. He still has multiple seasons of team control left. Munoz is on the last year of his deal, like I mentioned. They'll need a second baseman next season. And maybe with a change of scenery, someone like Tetsuda Yamada can return to his rookie form that he had with us, but with the Cardinals instead. So that's what we did at the deadline. We only made one trade. I didn't feel like we needed to really improve anything else. And now let's go over some of the trades that the CPU made. But before we actually do that, the Washington Nationals offered me a trade at the deadline for Eric Feedy, Fetty, whatever you say his name, underachieving 30-year-old starter, and Steve Ciszek, a very old late 30s reliever for Derek Rodriguez. As if I'm, like, one, not a contending team and a seller, why would I give up D-Rod as I'm a contending team? And also, neither of those guys are prospects. So if I was a selling team and I did try to sell D-Rod, why would I trade him for those guys? Really just gives you a glimpse on what the trade line logic is like in this game. MLB, we need some sort of slider for literally everything like 2K has. We also need the ability to review every single trade that goes through and decide if they are accepted or not, like you're able to do in my league, the superior franchise mode. So now on to the rest of the CPU trades, starting from the beginning of July, making our way to the deadline. The first one, Willie Calhoun has been sent to the New York Yankees in exchange for Estevan Florial. Basically, the Rangers are getting a younger outfielder with team control because I believe Willie Calhoun is either about to enter free agency or he has maybe like one year left of team control. 
Then you also have the Royals and the Indians making a trade as Jose Peraza, who was on Cleveland, has been sent to the Royals in return for three prospects. Khalil Lee, Scott Blewett, and relief pitcher Lewis McCollum are going to Cleveland. It's an in-division trade. Neither of these teams are contenders. The Royals are also way worse than the Indians, so I'm really not sure what's going on here, but that is a trade that happened. Astros and Angels also made a trade, another in-division one. Uh, the Angels are selling because they are out of the playoff race, so Brian Goodwin is going to the Houston Astros in return for three prospects. Starting pitcher Jason Schroeder, outfielder Richard, Richard Drummond, and then relief pitcher Henry Garcia. I believe all those guys are generated guys who have been drafted since the start of this franchise. As we move on to the Red Sox and Indians, Red Sox contending team send their star third baseman, Rafael Devers, to Cleveland. Cleveland, not a contending team, also just sold Jose Peraza for prospects, so I really don't understand what they're doing here. The Red Sox get outfielder Jake Bowers, not a prospect. Catcher Alfredo Gonzalez, who is a prospect. Relief pitcher Nick Whitgren, not a prospect, in return for their third baseman, who they're trading mid-playoff race that's very tight with the Yankees atop the AL East. Very interesting move from each team. Then we have another huge in-division trade as the Brewers and the Reds have swapped pieces. Nick Senzel... The star center fielder for the Reds has been traded in division to the Milwaukee Brewers, who are the first place team in the NL Central, as the Reds get three prospects in return. All pitchers, starter Jose, Her Her Jose Hernandez, closer Alfredo Villarreal, and then relief pitcher Mark McDonald. I get the Reds aren't making the playoffs. I think they're like a middling NL Central team. I'm not 100% sure, though. But I mean, sell selling Nick Senzel... It doesn't really seem necessary to me, so not really sure what they're doing, but AI trade logic. The Cardinals also made a trade where they picked up prospect first baseman Nick Prado, and in return they get outfielder Roman Quinn sent to the Royals. The Rays and Blue Jays, the two teams that linked up to trade Vladdy to the Rays in division, have once again traded another young prospect in real life who is probably good in this as well, I'm not 100% sure. Kevin Biggio, now a member of the Rays as him and Flatty have been reunited. And then the Blue Jays get catching prospect Anthony Siegler, who was with the Tampa Bay organization. And you may be asking yourself, why is he even with Tampa Bay? And that's because in real life, as you may know, he was the Yankees first round pick in 2018. He was one of the many B-potential catchers who just weren't brought back in their organizations after Season 1. That was a big thing after Season 1, I noticed, was there was a ton of B-potential catchers that just didn't get brought back in their organization. He was one of them, got picked up by the Rays, I'm presuming, although it could have been he got a, could have been picked up by somebody else and he could have been traded about seven different times. Since then, I just didn't really realize. Whatever it may be, he was on the Rays, now he's with the Blue Jays. The Twins and the Pirates made a deal as the Twins get Kyle Crick, a reliever from the Pirates, for two prospects. Twins are not a contender this year. I'm not sure if Kyle Crick is a rental. If so, it doesn't make any sense for them to be trading for Kyle Crick, but once again, AI trade logic. And then the Giants and Orioles, which is us, obviously. We did make one other trade, but it was just a minor league swap. We had even more minor leaguers go down with long-term injuries, so we had a shortage of catchers because of it, so we swapped a fireballer lefty, see potential starter, who is okay for a catcher who is great defensively, but essentially a pitcher at the plate to just fill out the organization in the catcher spot. So now that the trade deadline is out of the way, we are about to hop into a game against the San Diego Padres. As you can see, based on the standings, we are now a game and a half behind the Padres because we have dropped the first game of a four-game set with San Diego in San Diego. And just some updates on the roster. Jordan Hicks has been fully committed to as the closer. Reyes Maranza will now handle the setup duties, while Ryan Presley, Rysel Iglesias, Tanner Scott, and company can handle the less important situations. Part of that company is now Brandon Finnegan. As you saw, he did come in against the Marlins. He is one of the long relievers now, as he was having a great year in AAA, and his ratings are just so good to this point where I can't 
I can't ignore them, so I figured I would give him a shot in a spot where we haven't been able to have a guy settle in at that spot all season long. And like I mentioned, we do have more minor league injuries as two catchers throughout the organization. Both of them broke their arm, one of them just a broken arm, one of them a broken forearm, both of them on the 60-day IL. Here at Petco Park for a matchup between the two teams at the top of the NL West in the Giants and Padres. Padres sending out their ace right-hander Chris Paddock, 13-3, 2-6-0 ERA. He'll be opposed by Dylan Bundy, who doesn't quite have the season ERA that he had early on, but he does still have a solid season at a 3-5-1 ERA. Take a look at the Giants lineup, 1-2-9, as well as the opposing Padres lineup. We'll start things off top of the first inning, where the king of the first inning home run, Giants. Doc Peterson comes up, 26 home runs on the year, count him now he has 27. A solo shot for Peterson makes it a 1-0 lead for the Giants in this ball game. Not the way that Chris Paddock wanted to start off his day, but we move things on to the bottom of the first, where Luis Urias comes to the plate, pops one up the shallow left field, Peterson comes on, cannot make the shoestring catch, gets past him, and this is actually going to be counted as a double for Urias, so he's in second base in scoring position, brings up Machado, who has done literally nothing against lefties, and has pounded righties this year, and Dylan Bundy, what do you know, he's a right-handed pitcher, so Machado goes up the middle, drives in Urias, and ties the game at one here in the second. Move things on to the top of the third where Peter Mooney is going to get plunked on his elbow guard, so he'll take his base. Brings up the pitcher, Dylan Bundy lays down a bunt, but it's a failed sack bunt as they get Mooney at second, but Bundy beats it out on the back end. So runner on first as they trade places, as then Margot is plunked on the behind as he draws himself or he takes his base, I should say. So it's first and second, brings up Jack Peterson, hits a line drive the right field. Fran Mill catches it on the fly. Bundy tags up to goes to third. So runners on the corners with two bats for Javi Baez as he puts a charge into one to dead center field. This one is going to be caught at the fence as it is still 1-0. Bottom of the fourth now, Tatis draws himself a walk, so he's on first for Eric Hosmer. Gets a hanging changeup, and baby, he does not miss. You can kiss that ball goodbye. A 3-1 lead for the Padres, thanks to the two-run shot off of Eric Hosmer's bat. On to the seventh, or sixth inning now, as Austin Davis comes on, gives Hosmer a pitch on the hands that he somehow hits for 111 miles per hour off the bat into the gap. That's going to be an easy double for the lefty Hosmer. So he's in scoring position, brings up Will Myers, hits a dribbler in front of the plate, Bart makes the play, fires over to first, one down runner still on second. Then Buster Posey gets jammed, flies out softly to center field. They do not tag up, so two down runner on second now. Brings up the pitcher Paddock, who of course does not do anything, and he flares one out to shallow center, and it's still a 3-1 game. Bottom of the seventh now, as Davis tried to get the lefty Jan Kasky out, but he fights off a pitch inside for a base knock, so it's now up to Rysel Iglesias with a runner on first. He would try to pick off Jankowski, but he would still go and swipe second base as he's in there, gets himself into scoring position. So runner on second, nobody out. Now there's one down with a runner on third as Moody makes the spinning throw to fire out the runner at first, but there is a runner on third for Manny Machado, who has not been gotten out a single time this game. So the Giants intentionally walk him to set up the double play and take their chances with Fran Mill, and it works out as he strikes out for the second out of the inning. And then Tatis also strikes out on a slider as Iglesias keeps it as a 3-1 game. Still a 3-1 game, though, so the Giants do need to get some runs on the board. Trey Winginter comes on for the Padres. Seth Beer comes on to pinch hit, works the count full, and Beer will never break your heart except when it does. He goes down to the minors, works on some things, comes back, and then redeems himself with a pinch hit home run to make it a one-run lead for the Padres. A solo shot is fourth on the season. Then Jordan Hicks, with no guarantee of a ninth, comes on for the eighth, and he would keep it as it is, 3-2, as he would cap off a 1-2-3 inning by getting the former giant Buster Posey to pop up into foul territory. We move things on to the top of the ninth, 
Coda Glover gets the nod instead of their closer, and he would give up a long solo shot to Gilberto Fuentes, who continues his breakout season. This one is way out of here, 444 feet. He's even having some fun with the crowd, steps on the plate, tries to pump up the opposing crowd, and then even points at him. So it's a tie game, and the Giants weren't done. Joey Bart puts a charge into one left center field. Is this enough to get out of here? It is. Just barely clears the fence, and it's now a 4-3 ball game. Giants have the lead heading into the bottom of the ninth as Coda Glover blows the lead for the Padres. Reyes Moranza comes on, works two quick outs, but then Luis Urias hits a ball a long way into left field. That is out of here, ties the game with one swing of the bat as we have at least extra innings coming up as then Machado comes to the plate and he proceeds to hit a ball way left field, just barely fair as he knew he almost had it. And then the next pitch he strikes out in the slider. So Moranza luckily gets out of that inning with the tie. So we move on to extra innings where Matt Wisler came on for the Padres in the ninth, but he stayed on for a few innings, still working the 11th here. And Javi Baez rips one down the left field line. El Mago rounding first, heading into second base. Easy double for him. Brings up Joey Gallo, first pitch swinging, sending this one out to left center field, and he's going to trade places with Baez. Baez scores, Gallo now on second, it's an RBI double, 5-4 lead for the Giants. Gilberto Fuentes also swinging at the first pitch, grounds one out to second base, Gallo moves up to third, and then the CPU getting some taste of their own medicine, the suicide squeezes on, brings in another run, makes it a two-run lead for the Giants. So Tanner Scott comes on in the bottom of the 11th, working with a two-run lead, looking for his first save of the season, and he would get just that as Francisco Mejia pops up to shallow right field. It's caught by Ramos, and that is the ball game. They needed 11 innings, but the Giants do come out on top to take game two of this set from the Padres in a 6-4 victory. Player of the game honors goes to Seth Beer for his pinch hit home run in the 8th, which made it a 3-2 game. Fuentes tied it at 3. Bart gave them a 4-3 lead, then Maranza blew that, but then it was picked up by his offense in the 11th as Baez and Gallo combined to retake the lead, which they did not lose, obviously, as the Giants win this one over the Padres. So taking a quick look at the Cy Young race after this game against the Padres, where it is the Padres 1-2-3 starters all battling it out for the Cy Young. Mackenzie Gore, Chris Paddock, and Denilson Lamette. I don't know who they think they are. Only I'm able to do that with my rotation from the Oakland A's franchise. And if you take a look at the standings, the Giants have been playing very poorly post-trade deadline. After splitting that series against the Padres, they then split a two-game set with the Rangers, swept by the Dodgers, lost a series to the Blue Jays even, lost a series to the Braves, and now we're heading into a rubber match game against the Brewers. So the Giants are now four games back in the NL West, no longer in a neck-and-neck -neck race with the Padres, but they are no longer in a two-team race, as the Dodgers are still very much in it. They're playing well. They're back in the race, even for the division. And even the wild card is no longer a lock for the second-place team in the NL West. So the Giants need to pick it up here for the rest of August and September, as they could very well even miss the playoffs if they continue to play this poorly. There has also been a roster move that has been made as Sheldon Noisy has been sent back down to AAA Sacramento, and to take his place, Leonardo Rivas has been added to the 40-man roster and called up. He is a solid defender, he's pretty fast, and he has incredible plate discipline, so Leonardo Rivas is now the backup infielder. Giants travel out to Miller Park for a battle of two playoff hopeful teams and the Giants and Brewers. The Brew Crew sending out their right-hander Freddie Peralta for the 26th time this season, and he'll be opposed by Derek Rodriguez, the Giants' ace toe in the slab with his 2.64 ERA for the 26th time this season. Giants line up 1-9, there you have it, as well as the opposing Brewers line up 1-9. Nick Senzel leading things off at the bottom of the first, the newest member of the Brewers, and he is going to lead off the game with a 
rip down the left field line that lands in fair. That's going to be a double for Senzel. So he's in second base in scoring position. Now with one out, it's Christian Yelich. Hits a ball out to left field. Peterson didn't, he could have made the play, but he just didn't make the play on it. So as a result, Senzel is able, only able to move up one base. So it's second and third, one out. Travis Shaw then grounds one into the shifted in infield, which Mooney then tosses over to third base. But luckily, Yelich is caught in a rundown. So it's going to be runners on the corners with two outs. As then Jerickson Profar skies one in the infield. Leonardo Rivas is camped under it as he makes the play. So still scoreless. We move things on to the top of the second where Elliot Ramos, who has been on fire in this series, comes to the plate with two outs, gets a pitch he likes, and powers it out to right center field. That's going to get down in the gap. Easy double for the fleet-footed Ramos. And that double puts him above Peter Mooney, now on the team leaderboard for doubles. And speaking of Peter Mooney, he is the batter at the plate who does not fare well as he goes down on the drop third strike, tossed over to first as he is retired, still scoreless. Bottom of the second, Orlando Arcia. Ground ball up the middle after a long AB with D-Rod. So Arcia on first, as then it's going to be a pop-up behind the plate from Longy as he is going to be retired. And then it would be Chris Oakey, the catcher, grounding into a 3-6-3 inning ending double play. Still a nothing-nothing game. Fast forward to the fifth inning now. D-Rod perfectly placed curveball to retire Longy for the first out. And then it would be Oki going down on a curveball as well. And then just an unfair, perfectly placed curveball on the outside half to the pitcher. Peralta stood no chance as D-Rod strikes out the side. On to the top of the sixth now, Jock Peterson draws himself a walk. He'll take his base. So runner on first base now with one out for Javi Baez. He's going to muscle a ball inside pitch to him. That's going to muscle into the right center field gap. It's going to be an easy double, but Peterson only goes first to third. Javi extends his hit streak with that double as well. So Freddy Peralta, who is solid to this point, comes out of the game with runners on second and third. Phil Bickford comes out of the pen for the Brewers. And Joey Gallo would sky a ball to left field. That's going to be caught right in front of the track, and it's going to be deep enough to allow both runners to tag up. So the Giants finally get on the board here as they have a 1-0 lead thanks to the sack fly. Javi, or Joey Bart then comes to the plate with Javi Baez on third. First pitch swing and pop up to Yelich in right field. Doesn't even have to move. So still a 1-0 game as we move on things to the top of the seventh. Elliot Ramos slapping one through the right side of the infield for a base knock. Then a Lorenzo Ordonez grounds over to first base and the throw to second pulls him off the bag. Throw to first, not in time. Everybody is safe. So then Seth Beer is called upon to pinch hit for the Giants. Takes a ball four, doesn't even get any pitches to hit. So it's bases juiced for the recent call up in Leonardo Rivas. And he gets a pitch he likes, but he pops it up sky high to the infield. Infield fly rule. So Rivas throws his bat down in frustration, but then Jock Peterson draws himself a walk, so it walks in a run. 2-0 is the score now. So bases juice still for Javi Baez, as Bickford all of a sudden figures out where the strike zone is. After fouling off a few pitches, Baez strikes out on a slider. Reyes Maranza comes on for the eighth, trying to keep the score where it is. Does just that, strikes at Senzel for the third out of the inning. We now move on to Jordan Hicks in the ninth with his sub-1 ERA, and he would work a 1-2-3 inning, topped off by a shallow pop-up in left field from Travis Shaw, as that is your ball game. Can of corn for Jock Peterson out there, as the Giants win this very boring game with almost no offense, 2-0, over the Milwaukee Brewers here at Miller Park. Derek Rodriguez gets player of the game honors. He struck out seven batters through six innings, only gave up four hits, no earned runs, and no walks on the day for him. Only four hits for the Brewers. They do not score a single run, and only six hits on the day for the Giants. Their runs came in on a sack fly and a walk with the bases loaded, and that was all it took to beat this Brewers team as the Giants win this ball game. With that being said, that's going to wrap things up here for this edition of the San Francisco Giants franchise. I've been your host, Jersey Born, and I am saying, the short bagel guy is the perfect representation of every middle-aged man in the tri-state area. <laughs>